Welcome everyone. Welcome to our eighth edition of In Science International Science Film Festival. Uh, my name is Nort Flemix. I'm a developer of public lectures at Radboud Reflect. And tonight we have a very special evening, uh, the Big Ideas Lecture, which is a, co a collaboration between us, Radboud Reflect, um, and In Science. Um, our main guest of the evening, uh, I guess most of you already know him, uh, Neil Harbison, uh, but for those who might not uh, know him that well, uh, some context. Um, Neil has, al has always been unable to hear sounds, and that's why back in 2004 he decided to uh, get an implant uh, in his head, in the back of his head, uh, which allows him to perceive colors through audible vibrations in his skull. Um, since then, Neil uh, became officially recognized as a cyborg by the British government and since he advocated for cyborg rights. Um, this, of course, raises some very important and increasingly urgent uh, questions. For example, what does it actually mean to be a cyborg? Uh, and how can we actively participate in our own biological evolution in which we may increasingly emerge with or maybe even become technology at some point? rather than just using uh, or wearing technology as an external tool. Uh, these and many other topics um, will be topics that uh, Neil will elaborate further on. Um, and we will follow up with a conversation. We had a second guest for, for this, but unfortunately she called in sick a few hours ago. So I will do the conversation myself as well. Um, so while I definitely... Um, not as prepared as I wanted to, I will do my best. Um, finally, you will have, uh, the audience will have um, um, a moment to ask questions, which will be like 15, 20 minutes. So enjoy the evening, and please give a round of applause for Neil Harvest. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I was born uh, completely colorblind, so I've never seen color. Uh, one in every 33,000 people are born completely colorblind. It's called achromatism. So I've always seen in grayscale. To me, television and films are still in black and white, and the sky is always gray. So I've never really understood what color is, because if you've never seen color, you can't really uh, understand what it is. Even if you try to explain it very well, it's hard to imagine what blue is or what pink is, because it all sounds very, very strange. So as a child, when I knew that I couldn't see color, the first thing I did was to try to ignore the existence of color, but it was impossible. Even if you don't see color, you can't ignore that color exists because people who see color keep mentioning it every single day in daily elements like um, just red cross, like pink panther, green peace, um, yellow submarine, the green card, Bluetooth, yellow pages, um, blue cheese, uh, pink Floyd, uh, James Brown is in his last name, or this huge country called Greenland. So every single day I would hear uh, someone mention a color. So it was hard to ignore it. Also, when you use color as a code, it can be confusing. Hot water and cold water sometimes is only expressed through color codes. Also, when I was trying to learn the colors of flags, I had this situation. Uh, oh, no, not this one. This is when I look at maps. This is. Maps sometimes depend on color, because this is fine, I can follow the line, but if I go to Tokyo, I can get easily lost, because some maps really depend on color perception. And the situation with flags is this one, like three countries sharing exactly the same flag. So life was a bit confusing as a child, because uh, I tried to ignore color, but you kept mentioning it, and you kept using it as a code. Also, if someone would ask me, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes, and dressed in pink, <laughs> I would have absolutely no idea, because the only information I get here is that the man has <laughs> hair, that he has eyes, and that he's not naked, basically. So I wanted to sense color because uh, it's a social element, but I didn't want to change my sight, because to me, grayscale vision was my normal sight. So I tried to find ways of uh, perceiving color. I was interested in this theory. Isaac Newton created a theory in the 1600s relating each color of the rainbow to a musical note. So I thought this was really interesting because I was a musician, so I thought it would be great to create a system that would allow me to actually 
connect light frequencies into sound frequencies. So that's what I did uh, almost like 20 years ago. In 2003, I started this project uh, creating a system with Adam Montandon that transformed light frequencies into sound frequencies. It was a software, a webcam, and then it detected the vibration of red and it slowed down until you could hear the vibration of red. Red, for example, uh, travels at 420 millions of millions of waves per second. If we could hear this, we would hear a note between F and F sharp. So that's what the software did. It allowed me to hear the vibration of red, hear the vibration of orange, yellow, pink, and then I started memorizing the, the sounds of color, and instead of using it as a tool, I decided to attach it to my head in a, with sellotape in 2003, and then tried to use it as a wearable, and then I started hearing colors with the system, and I memorized the sound of each color. This is, for example, we're hearing now red frequencies going to orange. So I slowly learned the names that you gave to colors through sound, and I memorized that F is red, C sharp is blue, G is yellow, and I was slowly able to identify all the visual spectrum through sound waves. But I didn't want to stop there. Why stop in the visual spectrum? The technology also detects infrareds and ultraviolets, so I decided also in to include infrareds and ultraviolets in the system, and then suddenly I was walking around and I was able to sense infrareds. Uh, infrareds are interesting because they allow me to know if there's movement detectors in a room, so I can tell if the alarms are on or off in a shop or in a bank. So if I sense there's no infrared, the alarms are <laughs> off, and this can uh, help me uh, understand if the alarms are on. Ultraviolet perception is interesting because it allows me to feel if it's a bad day to sunbathe. If I sense high levels of ultraviolet, I avoid the sun. So these are two senses that other species have and that we could also include uh, by merging with technology. This was the first system, but and it wasn't comfortable. I didn't want to use technology or wear technology. The first system 20 years ago was very uh, wearable, and I, want this, I wanted this to be included in my body, so I tried to design an organ so that it would be implanted inside my head, and I thought that maybe an antenna would be a good option, because there's many species that have antennas, so I thought the idea was to create this antenna that would allow me to receive the vibrations of the color directly inside my head. So I designed this with a friend, and then I went to the doctor and I said I wanted to have this antenna implanted in my head and then the doctor said, sorry, we don't do this here. If you want to have an antenna implanted, first of all, you have to convince a bioethical committee. So I presented the antenna surgery to a, a, co a committee and they uh, said it was not ethical to have this antenna implanted in my head for three reasons. One, because it's not a pre-existing body part, so if it was a leg or an arm, they would find it ethical. Uh, antennas are not human, so it's not ethical to have an antenna implanted in our head. Second reason is because uh, sensing ultraviolets and infrareds are not, um, it's not a human sense, so they didn't find it ethical either. And the third reason is that they were very worried about the image the hospital would have if someone came out with an antenna sticking out of the head. So they said no, but they helped me find a doctor willing to do the surgery, and we did the surgery with an an anonymous doctor. So this is my head facing down. First, some hair was removed, and then the drilling started. There was four different drillings. One is for this chip inside my head that allows me to feel the vibrations of color. So if there's red, the vibration of red enters inside the skull, and then it makes a, a piece of vibrate, and this allows me to feel the vibration of color, and also it becomes an inner sound, so then I can hear it inside my head. The two other implants are to hold the structure of the antenna, and the fourth implant is internet connection, so I can also receive colors from other parts of the world. So this then was closed, and it took uh, two months to merge with my head. So now the antenna is part of my skeleton, which means that I'm also officially taller, because this is part of my body, and I had to get used to the new height, not only to the new sense, but also to the new height. I see this as the sonochromatic sense, and uh, it's now integrated uh, as part of my body and as part of my senses. Internet connection has allowed me to receive colors from other people. Uh, we've been using the internet as a communication system for many years and as a tool, but I think the next stage is that we start using it as a, a sense or a sensory extension. In my case, there's been five people that are allowed to send colors to my head by using their mobile phone. They can stream live images and then send it directly to my head so I could be here, but suddenly be receiving colors from a supermarket in New York 
or a sunset in, in Australia. So friends can share their sense of color directly into my head. And I, I think this is a, 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 the future use of the, of the internet as a sensory extension or just a sense. If they send colors when I'm sleeping, they either wake me up or they color my dreams. So if I'm sleeping and they start sending yellow frequencies, a lemon might appear in my dream or shades of yellow might suddenly appear in the dream. So this can also alter someone's dreams. So the internet connection also allows me to connect to NASA's International Space Station. Uh, s s when I do this, my sense of color is no longer in Earth, but in space, and this allows me to sense frequencies that I never receive here. There's lots of ultraviolets in space. Uh, space is not black, it's full of colors that we can't see. But sensing ultraviolet allows me to receive these uh, microtones of ultraviolet from space. It's very overwhelming. So I see this as becoming a sense turnout. Having senses in space, instead of having to physically go there, might allow us to explore space without having to physically go there. So having internet in the body has one main risk, which is that I can be physically hacked. Through all these years, it only happened once that someone without permission started sending colors to my head. So I was physically hacked once, but I actually enjoyed it. It was a, an interesting experience <laughs> to suddenly receive colors from an unknown person. But in order to stop this from being possible, uh, a few years, two years ago, I decided to um, stop these internet connections. And now the only way to connect to my head is via the blockchain. So in order to send colors to my head, you need to do it through an NFT. There's an unlockable content that allows you to connect to my head, and this allows you to send colors directly into my head in a very much secure way, because now it's uh, impossible to be hacked. Uh, uh, you would, it's impossible to, for me to be hacked. So this is now a way of connecting our bodies to the internet in a safe way via NFTs using the blockchain. I see all this as cyborg art, the art of creating new senses, new organs, and designing our perception of reality. It's an art movement that happens within the body. Traditionally, there's a separation between the artist, the work of art, um, the space where the art is happening, and the audience. In cyborg art, it all happens in one place. So I'm the only one in the audience experiencing the artwork. And in order to experience cyborg art, you need to become a cyborg. And then there's other people who are merging with technology to experience cyborg art. Cyborg is a word that has been around for over 60 years now. It's a combination of cybernetic organism, and it was created by Manfred Kleins. I went to his house uh, years ago to ask him, why did you create this word? And his, question, his answer lasted two days. So I had to go back the next day because his answer was a very, very long answer. Uh, <laughs> he kept uh, explaining why he created the word, but I'll try to simplify. He said that uh, one of the reasons is because this word already existed in 1960, bionic, it's someone's body modified by electronics. This word also existed, mechatronic, someone's body being modified by mechanical parts. And he wanted a new word that would include the mind. And that's why he created cyborg. Cyborg includes the modification of the mind by merging with technology. So any type of technology that modifies your mind uh, can be considered a cyborg. Uh, so I also created this one, cyborg, which actually is anyone who is psychologically merged with technology. And I think most uh, people are already psychologically merged with technology. You can notice it in language. Maybe 20 years ago, most people would say, my mobile phone is running out of battery. And now many people say, I'm running out of battery, as if you were running out of battery. So if you say this, uh, this is already a sign that you are merged psychologically with your mobile phone, and you're talking about it in first person. This is an MRI scan of my brain. I feel no difference between the software and my brain anymore, and I that's why I consider myself a cyber and I define myself as a cyber because I feel no difference between the software and my brain and I feel no difference between my body and the antenna. And this is what I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004 because I had to renew my UK passport and my photo was, was rejected. They said that there was a problem with the photo. They said that you cannot appear on uh, passport photos with electronic equipment. I replied saying that the antenna is not an electronic equipment, but a new organ. And I told them that I identified as a cyborg. 
and they replied saying no, that uh, this was not acceptable. So it became a battle in 2004 with the UK passport uh, office in order to convince them that they should accept this as an organ. And after some months they accepted the explanation and they allowed me to appear in the passport with the antenna. So this helps travel freely around the world. If there's a problem in an airport security, uh, I just show the passport and they see that the antenna is part of my official images and this helps travel freely. I'm also in conversations with the Swedish government now because the material that I used to create the antenna is Swedish, so I'm telling them that I am Swedish because <laughs> part of my body is Swedish. So I think I should be allowed to become a Swedish citizen. The, uh, the, the way you can become a Swedish now is you need to live in Sweden for at least five years. But I'm telling them that Sweden has been living in my body for more than five years, so I think <laughs> that I should be allowed to become a Swedish citizen as well. They haven't replied yet, but hopefully they will. <laughs> so hearing color, uh, sensing color through sound waves is, has changed my life in many ways. Now I can dress in a way that it sounds good. It doesn't necessarily need to look good, but I can dress in C major uh, by wearing this uh, color combination. I can dress in F minor, this is a sad combination I could wear in a funeral because it's a minor chord. Or I can also design clothes that, that sounds like a specific song. So these are uh, clothes that I designed that sounds like specific different melodies and the hair was also designed so that it sounded in a specific musical chord. Also I can design houses uh, or paint my house in a way that it sounds good. So uh, living rooms, if they're pink, yellow and blue, sound C major so it's a good color combination if I go into uh, my living room because it sounds major. Floors, I like them red because it gives a profound sound to the whole house. Red is very low frequency. Ceilings black and white so that if I lie down there's no sound. Exit doors is good if they're green because green is in the middle of the spectrum so it's like a tuning fork before you go out in the street. Bedrooms, I like three colors. Uh, turquoise, which is B. Uh, pink, which is E and violet, which is D. So I have B, E, D, bed. So it makes sense to have these three <laughs> notes in the bedroom. And then kitchens, they're good if they're violet. Violet is a high frequency that doesn't interfere with food because we don't usually eat uh, violet food. So violet keeps you alert in the kitchen. I can now also compose music by looking at things. I used to be a pianist, but now I don't need to play an instrument. I just need to look at different things and move my head and then I can compose music by looking at different vegetables or fruit, for example. This is an example of a fruit com composition. Milk is silent. So <laughs> I really enjoy walking around supermarkets now because it's like going to a nightclub because you have very different combinations of colors, especially the aisles with cleaning products. That's a very exciting <laughs> area of a supermarket. So it has completely changed my experience of a supermarket. Also, it has changed my experience of art galleries because now I can go to an art gallery and listen to a Picasso, listen to an Andy Warhol. They all are musicians now and they all sound different. This is the sound of the scream. Traditional paintings are, are uh, softer, less saturated, so they sound a bit less and they're usually m more microtonal. Another thing that I can now do is that, that I can paint what I hear. So when I listen to music, I can also experience color because uh, I'm so used to hearing color that when I hear music, I can also relate it to color, so I can paint what I hear. This is uh, Mozart's Queen of the Night, the song uh, transposed into color, note by note from the middle to the end. So if I go close with the antenna, I can hear Mozart's Queen of the Night. And this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber. So it looks very different 
because it uses very different notes. Also, speeches can be transposed into Kukalego because when we speak, we use different frequencies that also relate to different colors. So I've transposed different speeches into color. This I'm is an not example. I'm surprised that many people feel lost and unable to decide what to hold on to and what to discard. How to take advantage of the new life without losing the best of the old. But it's not the new inventions which are the difficulty. The trouble is caused by unthinking people who carelessly throw away ageless ideals as if they were old and outworn machinery. So this was the queen and she, I transposed that in another speech uh, when she was older and she actually treated almost the same color. So it's, uh, it was interesting for me to see that her frequency range didn't vary through the, through the years. Another huge change has been the way I sense food now because when I look at food, I can hear food. So uh, I really enjoy composing music with food, especially with salads, because there's different notes. Uh, so I created a project with a restaurant where we designed uh, a plate where you have this same sensor inside the plate. And then when you put the food on the plate and you rotate it, you can hear the food. So you can go to this restaurant and order some um, music, uh, like some Lady Gaga dessert, and then you can eat a song. It rotates and the chef becomes a composer. This is how it, it works. So it's quite challenging because the chef needs to find the right notes uh, and then rotate and until it sounds uh, perfectly right. So we call this the plate player and then you can eat something. So if you know people that don't like eating vegetables, maybe if they suddenly eat the vegetables in the form of a song, it might completely change the perception of the vegetables and they might eat their vegetables. So it, it can change the way you sense food if you add a new layer of perception. Also another layer of perception is the way I sense people, because when I look at you, when I look at someone's face, I can hear your face. So it has completely changed the way I sense people's faces. So I really enjoy creating sound <laughs> portraits where I get close to someone's face and then I write down the sound of the eyes, the lips, the skin and the hair and then I send them an mp3 of their face so they can listen to themselves. The first one, one of the first ones I did was of Prince Charles because he came to, to the university and then I asked him if I could listen to his face and this was his reaction when I asked him if I could listen to his face. But then I got close and he sounded very C major and then since then I've been doing many, many faces and it's interesting to see how we all sound different and uh, for example, uh, Robert De Niro has a melody in his lips. Uh, Marina Abramovich has very low frequencies that create a rhythm. Uh, Philip Glass sounds microtonal. Um, Bono had very loud glasses. Judy Dench has silent hair. Steve Wozniak has an A in his eyes, so like a pure A in his eyes. But what really shocked me is that people who say they're white, they're not white. And people who say they're black, they're not black. People who say they're white, they're actually very, very light orange. And people who say they're black, they're very, very dark orange. So the fact that people say that we are black and white is completely false. We are all different shades of orange. This is an example of a sound portrait. So now we're hearing both eyes, which are slightly different. for a unique face. Even twins sound slightly different. Even the left and the right eye sound slightly different. This allows me to create uh, also face concerts where uh, I, the people cue and then I start creating music from the audience and I create layers of sound. So if the concert sounds really bad, it's not my fault. It's the audience's fault because that's where the music is coming from. So basically new senses will create new cultures. In my case, just hearing color has created my own world and if there's more people with this sense it will create a culture surrounding this new sense and the more senses we create the more types of culture will e emerge 
Uh, I think most inspiration will come from other species. There's many, many senses and organs that exist already, uh, that surround us already, that we humans don't have, and that we will slowly merge with them in order to gain new experiences of reality. These are the examples that are already happening. Elephants, for example, can sense uh, earthquakes through infrasounds in their bones, and Moon Rivers created a similar sense by having two sensors implanted in her feet that allow her to feel the seismic activity of the world. Whenever there's an earthquake in the world, she feels a vibration in her feet, so she's connected to online seismographs. She uses this as well in dance, so she does performances where she moves according to the earthquakes that are happening live in, in the planet. Uh, so it's seismic uh, dance and seismic percussion. She also used the internet connection to sense moon quakes, so there's also a seismograph on the moon, so this allowed her to become a sense turnout and sense moon quakes, and in the future she might also be able to sense Mars quakes or other quakes. Other projects we've done is uh, inspired by bone conduction communication, which is something that elephants do. They communicate by doing this on the floor and then they, they can feel it and they can communicate far away through bone conduction. So inspired with this, we went to Brazil and we created uh, a system of communication by having a tooth implanted in my mouth and Moon had a tooth implanted in her mouth and then whenever I clicked, she would receive a vibration in her mouth and whenever she clicked, I would receive a vibration in my mouth. It worked via Bluetooth sent to the mobile phone, from mobile phone to her mobile phone, from mobile phone to her mouth. So it was a, a Bluetooth tooth that allowed us to communicate from mouth to mouth. We both learned the Morse code, so we were able to send words to each other and we did the first public demonstration in Sao Paulo where people would give us words and then I would send the word to Moon which was in a different room and then we, we managed to send uh, words to each other and uh, we called it the Transcendental Communication System. This is a system that will work in space because there's no air conduction in space, also underwater. And if you are completely paralyzed but you can still move your mouth, this can also be used to communicate via, via Morse code. Another sense that exists is echolocation. Many sh fish can feel what's around them by echolocation, and that's something that Joe Dagny did. He had two implants placed here and at the back, and then without using his eyes or ears, he could feel presence around him. So at the beginning, it was uh, 20, uh, no, two meters, so he would feel presence 20 meters, but he can change the range and he can feel presence around him. There's other sensors like magnetoception. Some animals can sense if something is magnetic, but we don't. We need, we, we have no way of knowing if something is magnetic. So inspired with this, we created magnetic hair that can be implanted and then the hair will get stuck if there's something magnetic. So walking around past the fridge will definitely make you stuck your hair. So it's a very simple implant that allows you to have magnetoception. Also, many species have the ability to create light, bioluminescence. So uh, I had another tooth missing, so I decided to create a tooth that creates light, and then by clicking it, I have emergency light in my mouth. The problem is that when I was eating, the light was always going on and off, so I tried to find, uh, had it removed, and now we're trying to find a different way to turn it on and off that doesn't go with the click. Geomagnetism is also a, a sense that many species have, feeling where the north is, so uh, we did this compass implant in Barcelona. The surgery was done publicly in a festival, so it lasted a few hours, but the audience, or the people in the festival, could see the progress of the implant. So uh, Manel, Moon, and I had this uh, compass implanted in our knee, and this allowed us to suddenly feel where the north is. It's like a compass that gave us a small pressure where the north is, and this when you have it for a long time, you suddenly start perceiving your city differently. Also, when you're in the subway, you suddenly realize how much you're moving. So it, it suddenly changed the way we would sense our own environment, and it created new types of memory. Depending on how or where we were standing, we would remember that we were facing southwest or northeast. So it's an interesting experiment. Um, Manel de Agos was always interested in weather stations, in the weather. There are many weather stations that can sense uh, weather very precisely. Uh, so Manel wanted to have this in his body, so he had two fins implanted that allow him to sense 
temperature, humidity, and atmospheric pressure in a very precise way. We couldn't find anyone in Barcelona willing to do the surgery, so we went to Japan, and he had two different implants here so that he could connect the fins, and then he can now feel the weather in a very precise way. And it's, uh, it was his uh, wish to connect to, especially to the rain, so now he can feel when it's going to rain, because he can feel the, the drop in pressure. There are many uh, elements like radars that can sense speed in a very specific way, in a very precise way. So this is a, a project that we did in 2007 that is basically not an implant, but just piercings that allow you to feel movement uh, very precise. So it moves, it vibrates, and then depending on the interval, you can slowly uh, detect the exact speed of a moving object in front of you. If you turn them around, then you can suddenly have uh, retroception. It's a sense that we give to cars. Many cars can sense what's behind, but we can't. We have to turn around because we all of our senses are basically focused on we, what we have in front. So by turning around the earrings, you can also sense what's behind you. Now, the current project I'm working on is, is uh, a sense of time. We all have a sense of time, but we don't have an organ specifically designed for sensing time. So um, I designed this uh, it's like a crown that goes around the head and it's a point of heat that takes 24 hours to go around the head. So you can feel the rotation of the planet in the body. If, you're, if you have it for several months, the brain will get used to the 24 hour cycle. And whenever this happens, uh, well, you will know when the sun is shining. So if you feel the heat here, you know it's, it's 12 solar clock in London, here it's in the US, so you can feel where the sun is shining. And when you are completely used to it, the, the aim is just to ask someone to change the speed uh, slightly in order to see if you can create time illusions. So if you want the situation to last longer, you can make it spin a bit slower and then this will make you feel that time is stretching. Or if you want to go faster, you can make it go faster. So the aim is to create time illusions and to um, well, basically to, to transform Albert Einstein's theory of time relativity into a reality, into a practical theory where you can actually decide how long you want the situation to last. This is one of the current cyborgs in Barcelona, Paul Lombarte. He's, he has electrodes in his uh, chest and then he's sending his heartbeats to the internet. Basically, you can also see his heartbeats through a light, so he's using this uh, to create artworks. He can send his heartbeats to lights around the world, so he can turn on and off lights around the world through his heartbeats. And also he has clocks that go according to his heartbeat. So there's galleries where you can go into the gallery and then you can see his clock, so you can see the heartbeat of the artist. Now, he also used the internet and the, an NFT uh, in order to send his heartbeats to, the, to, the, to these objects, and he also sold his heartbeats as a work of art. I bought his heartbeats, and he bought my uh, head, basically. We exchanged NFTs uh, a year ago, and now he has access to my head, and I has, have access to his heartbeats. So all of these projects are not artificial intelligence, they are AS, not AI, artificial senses. Uh, the difference is basically if the antenna was telling me the names of colors, that would be AI. So if it was saying red, blue, yellow, that would be AI. Technology would be giving me the intelligence, but I never wanted this. I didn't want technology to give me intelligence. I wanted technology to give me a sense. So the antenna is giving me stimuli, and then it's up to me to create intelligence or not. So when you merge with artificial senses, the intelligence will be slowly created by your own brain. If you merge with artificial intelligence, the intelligence will be given to you by the machine. I think it's much more exciting to merge with artificial senses, because then the intelligence will be more unique, or the knowledge created by your brain will be more unique to each person. Also, the reality that this creates is not augmented reality or virtual reality. I call it revealed reality. Technology can reveal elements that already exist and that they have existed uh, always, but what we as a species have never been able to sense. So this is a way of using technology in order to reveal elements that exist in front of us, but that we cannot sense as a species. Moon Rivers and I created the Cyber Foundation 12 years ago in order to 
uh, help other people become cyborgs and also defend cyborg rights. Cyborg rights are basically these ones. Uh, the first one is morphological freedom. We think with, we should all be allowed to become cyborgs. We should all be free to decide which organs and senses we want to have as a species. This is something that we still don't have. We are not free to decide. You will struggle to find a doctor or a bioethical committee willing to help you. So this is still not uh, seen as ethical. Uh, so, but in the future, there will be at some point cyborg clinics. Uh, organic naturalization is the, the right to be considered, these implants to be considered organs, not devices. And it, we, as I had the, the situation with the passport office. Also the freedom from being disassembled. Uh, Manel was asked to leave his job or to remove his fins if he wanted to continue working. So we think this is something that should never happen, that no one should force you to remove your new implants in order to maintain your job, for example. Uh, the other one is bodily sovereignty, uh, which is means that you should have the right to decide who is allowed to enter your body. If you merge with technology that has internet connection, you have the risk of being hacked, so you should be allowed to decide who is allowed to enter your body via the internet. Future senses that we might see are night vision. If there's night vision and, and we've, many people start having night vision, artificial light will no longer be necessary. So in the future, cities might be completely dark and we might stop using and wasting so much energy to create artificial light. So this would be beneficial for the environment because we wouldn't have to spend so much energy creating light. Also thermal regulation would be a great sense so that we wouldn't have to change the temperature of our surroundings. We would stop using heaters and air conditionings and we would start regulating our own temperature. So the aim of becoming a cyborg is to stop designing our surroundings, to stop changing the world, and to stop, start designing ourselves and changing ourselves so that we adapt to the planet and not the other way around. Just to end, this, is, this has been not just a, a personal project, but also a, a, a social one, because the antenna is very visible. Some implants are not visible, but the antenna is visible. So since 2004, I've encountered a lot of social reaction, and I've been speaking to strangers every single day since 2004. And to me, it's also been interesting how social reaction has changed through the years. In 2004, most people thought it was a reading light, and they would ask me if I could turn on the light. <laughs> so uh, th then in 2005 and six, people thought it was a flexible microphone. So they thought it was uh, for voice. In 2009, people thought it was a hands-free telephone because many taxi drivers especially had a hands-free phone and they all looked different. So they thought it was a, one of them. 2012, 13, they said it was a GoPro cam that I was filming people and people would wave at me thinking that I was filming them. In 2013, 14, people thought it was something to do with Google and that, uh, or Google Street View that I was streaming the streets. <laughs> In 2016, people, especially children, shouted at me Pokemon and they tried to catch me. Uh, as a 2000 and, well, it's, it has changed three years, but now people think it's similar to a, gel dispenser. So people always find ways of connecting what they see with what is popular at the moment. Also in, in different countries, it changes and it varies. And it's, it's been interesting socially to see how we react differently the, uh, when we see something that we, we're not sure what it is. The future is a big question mark because we are in a situation that we all could merge with technology, but it's not actually happening. It's still a very underground movement that people that f decide to merge with technology. But um, I think we can start seeing people that are al already psychologically merged with technology and that don't, they don't find it such a big step to merge biologically. So I think that in the near future, we'll see many more examples of people walking around the street with new organs, new senses, and this will allow us to express ourselves and to experience reality through new ways that go beyond what has been traditionally human. Thank you very much.